Okay, everybody, welcome back to another edition of The Orthodox Nationalist. I know I've been gone for a couple of months, and I know my critics were uh, were happy about that. But um, after receiving a, a series of emails and several imploring phone calls, uh, I have been convinced to uh, to come back and at least to do a a few more broadcasts. Uh, I uh, today am going to deal with somebody who I probably should have dealt with a while ago, somebody who gets talked about a lot, but who um, only gets read once in a while. I'm talking about somebody whose name shows up in every Russian history textbook, uh, and a name that without doubt is vilified and attacked and assaulted by uh, people more often than not who have either never read his material or who read it with such an intense prejudice that they, in fact, could not read it objectively. And I'm talking about Konstantin Pobodonostyev. Uh, Pobodonostyev, who died in 1907, is one of the most significant uh, royalist writers and theorists in at, at the, the end of the 19th century. He was the personal tutor to the young uh, Tsar Nicholas II and was the uh, chairman of the Synod of the Church and uh, as a result had uh, control over its finances, uh, at least, under the reign of uh, Alexander III. Uh, he is a uh, professor of law and legal philosophy. He spoke uh, many European languages and probably more than anyone else prior to Rasputin uh, came under some of the most vicious attacks from the left, from the revolutionaries, and even worse, from modern uh, English-speaking academics. In the academic world, European history, he is the symbol of all that's evil in European life and all that's evil specifically in uh, Russian life. When you read him, however, and I recommend um, a, a book that is uh, you could download for free on Google Books. It's called The Reflections of a Russian Statesman. And uh, it's, it's basically a summary of his political views uh, and religious views. And we're going to talk about that book a little today. Uh, and when you read his material, you realize, in fact, he was um, a fairly reasonable, uh, extremely well-read, very broad-minded, and that he had a, he had a general approach to to politics that was very specific to Russia and yet still had applications uh, within Europe as a whole and even outside of, of Europe. So, uh, Pobodonostiev, I'm willing to say, is probably uh, the um, most accomplished monarchist writer of the 19th century. I know there were some in, um, in France and in Germany, also uh, a very adept at this, but, but uh, Pobodonostiev um uh had a had a uh, a, tr a tremendous intellectual background and, and and we should take him uh very seriously now, at least for the fact that he was uh, the main teacher to to Tsar Nicholas II uh was the head of the uh, synod for a while and was just just very much a a constant part of the Russian uh, government and education for a long time uh at the very end of the 19th century so he's uh, he's someone whose influence needs to be taken seriously, whether or not you, you like him. He's somebody that, that was uh, immensely powerful, at least for a while. And I wonder, um, you know, he died in 1907. He died just before the Rasputin era in Russian history. And um, I have the feeling that if there was anybody strong enough intellectually, uh, mentally, spiritually, uh, to fight this guy and to get rid of this guy uh, from Russian life, it would have been him. And it's that's something that's you know one of these many what ifs in history that make that make our discipline so so interesting. Anyway, um, I will be doing uh, a couple of more shows for um, this this network. Uh, I'm happy to do it. 
Um, I've had my share of disagreements with with uh, listeners in the past, and um, I am willing to start over with uh, you know on a, with with, with uh, um, uh, to make a fresh start and to um, and to continue and to do what I always do and what I meant to do, and that is to talk about uh, Russian and Ukrainian Orthodox history, its um, mentality and its relevance for today, specifically the battle against the New World Order. And I've been saying this uh, from the very beginning. This is the reason why I, I went to graduate school in, in the first place and was abused, um, something something terrible uh, those years, but I made it. And, um, and so this is what I do. And it's certainly a lot more rewarding than being manipulated and attacked and assaulted physically and uh, mentally in the... In, in the academy in, in this country. Uh, but Pulpit Onestiev was a professor, a professor of law as well as legal philosophy and, and jurisprudence. And um, his, his main concern is to justify uh, an ideal conception of an, an orthodox uh, a monarchy in Russia and that it is not only the best form of government for Russians at the end of the 19th century, but also... Um, uh, superior to uh, the mockery of justice that he uh, views, and I personally view, uh, representative government to be, parliamentarism. And I've talked about that on, on this show in some detail. Um, reading Pope Honesty of, uh is really, it, it, it's hard to get through anything he does without really having um, your mind uh, disturbed. I mean, he, he shakes up your most fundamental uh, assumptions, and and he he has a tendency to leave the attentive reader a very different person. His first thesis. Remember, he you know he's a religious man, he's uh, he's an orthodox man completely. And his first thesis is that all government um, is based on religion. This is something, by the way. He shares with the anarchist movement. He shares with a lot of those on the extreme left that your initial real loyalty to the state, um, speaking very broadly, comes from the religious impulse. But in this case, Pope Anastasiev is, is speaking very specifically. He's saying that there is a spiritual bond between the common population and the state. The state is just the articulate part of the common population. Uh, and as a result of this, the church needs to be a part of the state administration to some extent or other. He believes the separation of church and state, which was one of the favorite slogans of Lenin, to be a complete fraud. Uh, the basis of the civil bond is a common faith in the population. When you don't have a common faith, you cannot have any strong civil bond. The one thing, all the problems in the Russian government at this time, the one thing that the people had in common with their rulers were, was the fact that, that they held basically uh, the same religious faith. And that this kind of faith ultimately um, uh, seeks a unity. It seeks a common foundation in truth. Without that, without that striving, there really can be no substantial connection between the common run of the population and the government. And even, even the worst of governments needs to have some bond with the population. It can't be this mere uh, alien entity imposed upon upon people but then he goes further than this and he and he holds to the view that without faith and now he's not speaking necessarily of orthodoxy I, mean, I want to make it clear that Pope honesty of holds um, orthodoxy to be the true religion he does hold that view and Russia has been uh, blessed by being its primary carrier in this period of time, in, in the late 19th century. Really, it's only independent carrier at the end of the 19th century, for the most part. Um, but he'll say that faith in general, some sort of spirituality, 
linking man in God is necessary to make sense out of human life. Our problems, our struggles, our sufferings, without this guarantee of a future life, without this guarantee of a benevolent God that will take care of his people no matter what they're going through at any given moment, that's the only thing that could bridge this gap between our existential despair on the one hand and living a peaceful and rational life on the other. If you eliminate God from life, a God who cares for people, a God who has a relationship with people, a real one, unless you have that, the problems of life seem absurd. And this is something that Pope Adonisiev shares with Dostoevsky and Gogol and so many writers within the Russian tradition. I want to say that Pope Adonisiev also had a problem with Dostoevsky when he read the Brothers Karamasa for the first time. The idea is that our problems as people, our psychological problems, our struggles, apart from any particular political or moral issue that we happen to have, our problems and the fact that we're going to die and we're going to get sick and we're going to get emaciated and we're going to end up, you know, be, you know, being, having dementia and stuff, that, that this pain, that's, that's too much. Life is an absurdity unless the soul is immortal and it can live with God forever after death. This is also the central thesis of Dostoevsky, and there's absolutely no doubt that, that Pope Adonisiev shares that with him and may even have taken that directly from him. But all of this that, that Pope Adonisiev is talking about is ultimately political and legal. That's his mission, that's his world, that's his area of expertise. And what he hates more than anything in the world, and this is going to come up again and again and again in his writings, in his speeches, in his teaching, in his lectures, and everything else he does in his life, very full life, is that party government, party politics is a sham and it's a fraud. It promises freedom and liberty to people, and all it gives them are half-witted politicians controlled by big money. Now, uh, dealing with church politics, and this is something that as, as chairman of the Synod of Bishops for a while, uh, Pope Adonisiev is, is very much conversant with, he fears the idea of the separation of church and state. And he points to the German Reformation as a historical example. When the church was separated from the state, all that happened is that the state absorbed the church and became the spokesman for the church. That whenever the church has no more role in state government life, it then becomes just another institution to be legislated on by the government. It becomes subservient to the state. And of course, later on, Lenin will use the slogan separation of church and state as a central plank in the Bolshevik program. And all he meant, ultimately, is the butchery of uh, the clergy and the monastics, regardless of their political program. Pope is is a, a little bit of a prophet in the sense in that he says, if the Russian church is separated from the state it will then become just another social institution. It will become just another business that satisfies a specific need of the population. They could go to church on Sunday and then be good pagans for the rest of the week. This is something very common in, in the West, very common in America. Uh, and, and, you know, we all have fallen into that kind of a rut. That the church cannot help but be a day-to-day -day part of our communal problems. That's part of what its mission is. It is not separated from public life. It is not separated from government. If government is just the rational expression of public life, and our public sense, and the public good, well then how can the faith of the overwhelming majority of the Russian population, and at the time he's writing, yeah, you know, their faith was very real and very powerful, how can this possibly not be a part of of governing institutions. Um, Pope Adonisiev identifies 
in his in his writing on this topic. He identifies a contradiction in um, the secular mentality. He says, on the one hand, I see that the apostles of secularism in the West and to some extent in Russia really exalt the nature of human wisdom and human reason. That human beings can solve all the problems of social life and cure diseases and do all of this stuff if just given enough time and money and power. And yet this level of exaltation of reason and the spiritual sense that can solve all of these problems ultimately comes from mere chance evolution from lower animals. He views that as a very serious contradiction in modernity and that the very concept of exaltation can't be explained. The very concept of a spiritual world can't be explained by mere uh, chance evolution alone. If anything, if man is ultimately just a slightly more advanced animal than the apes, the last thing that he should be entrusted with is government or science or politics or any kind of administration. And this concept is going to get developed later on where he really holds ultimately that given that problem, Man is just a kind of just a slightly more advanced animal, and yet he's the ultimate spiritual ruler of the universe, that those two things can't be true at the same time, will ultimately resolve itself in the idea that modernity is based almost exclusively on the rule of self-interest and utility, which is another way of saying the rule of those with money, power, and influence. This is why, ultimately, um, representation and liberal democracy, the way you see it in you know, England and America at the time, is a sham. It's just another way for rich people to dominate others without them realizing it. For the, for the upper bourgeoisie to rule uh, without responsibility, using politicians as their frontmen, using actors and actresses and singers and uh, cultural figures as frontmen. Their scripts are all written by the regime. They're all written by people who you and I don't know. And they use these people, whether they be politicians or preachers or um, or um, or cultural figures or singers or actors. They use these people as empty shells to promote their agenda. They get to rule without responsibility. And this ultimately is the evil of representation, of the evil of representative government, at least in the way that it developed in uh, Western Europe and what was, was uh, coming into uh, Russia at, at the time where, uh, where, where uh, Pobedonstiev was, was most active. I want to say something. You know, I've... A big problem for me over the last, I don't know, over the last two years maybe, maybe more than that, has been this constant back and forth I've been dealing with between Russia and Ukraine. And the, you know, the idea of um, uh, the Russian church being uh, overly regimented relative to the state and the Ukrainian church dedicating itself to what, you know, ultimately a spiritual uh, subornos, to the popular representation uh, within the church body, something very different from a political type of parliamentarism. Um, but even, you know, Pope Adonistiev holds to the view that the state choosing who will be bishop and who will not be is an uncanonical situation. He does hold that. He does hold uh, in, in his um, reflections of a Russian statesman that it is a problem that the Russian government has become so large that now it is deciding who becomes a bishop and who isn't. He does have a problem with that. And so even Pope Adonistiev holds to the view that um, the state is a bit too involved in the religious life. It, it doesn't negate his basic thesis about the relationship of church and state. It's just that as he's writing this, the turn of the century, as he's writing this, the state in Russia and other places 
has gotten uh, too much of the advantage relative to its domination uh, over the church. There's another problem with this so-called separation of church and state. It's not just a matter of institutions. It's not just a matter of the church does its own thing, the government does its own thing. That's not how it actually functions in reality. The way it functions in the day-to-day -day life of the ordinary person is that now his individuality has been divided radically and unnaturally in two. If the state and its administration over the economy takes care of bodily needs and the church takes care of the needs of the soul, the spiritual needs, now any individual in a society with radically separated churches and, and, and the government itself is now unnaturally divided in two parts. The person, therefore, in this situation is only loyal to the state to the extent that it delivers the economic goods and that it delivers the economic goods in the way that the person requires it. When you hold to the view that the state should only be concerned with providing for the material needs of the population, then you have to be prepared for the conclusion. The conclusion is that the state will only be considered legitimate to the extent and only to the extent that it is able to fill the stomachs of those who do the voting. Or, even if, if you don't vote, those who are living within the community. There is no other bond, there is no other connection between the government and the uh, population except a filled stomach. If my stomach is not filled, I hate the government. If it's filled, I love the government. That is absolutely on no planet is that an intelligent way to ground government policy. That is not the basis of loyalty to the state. Or at least shouldn't be the entire basis of loyalty to the state. So, Pope Adonisthiev is really concerned about what he views these foreign ideas coming in from the Masonic lodges of Western Europe. And he makes that very clear. He knows where this is coming from. And he wants to fight it. Uh, and we'll continue on this topic when we get back. All right, everybody. Welcome back to the Orthodox Nationalist. I am back, at least for a few more shows. Or, you know, maybe I'll get bored again and go off and do something else, but at least for the meantime, uh, I am back and I am here uh, doing a couple of more shows, and we're talking about Constantine Papadonistia, who dies in 1907, and is one of the more influential thinkers and political theorists and legal theorists of the latter half of the 19th century uh, and a few years into the 20th century. We're talking about his views on the church, government and the nature of Western parliamentarism or, or representative government as it is uh, romanticized. And th the concept really is this. Pope Adonistiev is holding that you have people in Russia who want the Orthodox Church separated from the government. And yet the Orthodox Church is the living real faith of a huge proportion, a huge majority of the population, even those of, of non-Russian background. Uh, and, and so what you're going to end up with is a government that is very alien to the average person. The average peasant looks to the government as some, in some sense, a sacred institution. It's more than just that entity that fills our stomachs. It's something that we have a bond with because we have the same hope of the future life. That's what really connects um, uh, people to the state, not just the simple economic or utilitarian world, especially in the case in, in Russia where, for the most part, economic decisions, at, the, at least among the peasants, were made within the communal structure at the local level and not at the federal level or even the provincial level. Ultimately, the bond of a peasant living in Siberia in the 1880s and the Tsar in Moscow, 3,000 miles away, is religion, certainly not policy. I wrote in my first book, uh, The Third Rome, which I, I hear is, is for sale again, 
and I have a link on my website uh, to, to buy it. There's some things in there that I'm kind of iffy about now because uh, I wrote it before I was 30, I think, and, uh, and I'm a little older now, and I, I, I there's some things that I'm iffy about. But one of the things I say there is is that, you know, the concept of the political in royal government is different than the concept of the political in modern parliaments. For the, the word political really meant in, in Moscow or St. Petersburg, it meant foreign policy and basic taxation military stuff. That's really what it meant. Economics and all this other stuff, that was meant to be dealt with by peasants, by tradesmen, by artisans, and all of their, uh, the artel and all of these informal organizations coming together to solve these problems. That was not necessarily the business of the central government. You know, for the most part. The concept of the political has changed radically. This is not lost on Pobodonist yet. He holds that modernity is frightening because it holds that everything is now a political and therefore a legal problem. Everything from how we work and where we work and how long we work, our marriages, our children, how they're educated, all of this stuff, is not just a, a, a an issue for localities to work out. It's now a matter of federal legislation and judicial activism and police power and taxing power. And Pope Honesty of you know scratches his head and he says all of this talk in America and Britain and France about liberty and yet all I read in their newspapers, and he was fluent in these languages, you could read these newspapers, is more legislation, more laws, more regulation, higher taxes, more regimentation. Every group that has a beef with the society demands more and more, uh, uh, demands more and more legislation to support their cause. And of course, what that really means in practice is to silence their opponents. The idea is when you take state power, all it means in practice is that your opponents are now in big trouble. Unity is the last thing. You know, when, when, when Pope Donosiev talks about the spiritual life, he likes to stress the idea that without unity, without the community, spiritual life is, is nonsense. It's just a group of people arguing over metaphysical concepts. It means nothing. It, it, it does more harm than good. That the real spiritual life aims at real, truthful, foundational unity. And yet when he looks at democratic governments in Western Europe, all he sees is one faction using money and influence to destroy another faction. Back and forth. And when the one group is out of power... Uh, it, it, it's, uh, its agenda is, is harmed, is destroyed, is overthrown. The last thing that modernity is about, in, politically speaking, is unity. Unity is the last thing that's going to occur in the democratic societies. And ultimately, he sees all of these cries for liberty from the French Revolution onward. He sees these cries for liberty as nothing more than the government growing tremendously large at the expense of its citizens. And even more than that, that liberty really means in practice that my faction will take over the government and force my enemies to shut up. And of course, in our time, we have hate, uh, you know, hate speech and hate uh, thought laws as really the, the ultimate expression of what a guy like Puppet Honesty have couldn't even uh, imagine at the end of the 19th century that when a government not only uh, abandons the faith of the common population, you know, speaking very generally, it doesn't have to be a very specific faith like Orthodox. I mean, you know, Pope Donosiev is talking about Russia. It should be an Orthodox thing. But in more, you know, countries with more religious diversity, it should be a bit more general, but still present and still spiritual and still about God and His relationship to His people. I mean, it's not, you know, when you abandon that, and like in, in, in America, where you, where you're openly hostile to that, you cut yourself off 
from so many people who would otherwise be your uh, friends and supporters. Pope Honesty of holds that really when you say the word liberty and separation and disestablishmentarianism, these kind of words, when you say this, what you really mean in practice, you don't mean it ideally, but you mean it, well, how it, how it works out in practice is the growth of the government, the domination of the government over every aspect of human life. That was not the case in Russia when Pope Donostiev was writing. And he's very sensitive about the fact that the Russian government has become a bit too strong relative to the bishops of the church, but that the concept is still valid. All right. Ultimately, the 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 theory is the thesis is how it's come to at this point in the discussion. The idea is that modernity errs tremendously when it, speaking very generally, views the human person as an intelligent machine. That is a recipe for destruction. It's a recipe for immorality. No matter how you define immorality, if you're just an intelligent machine, then life and death are absolutely indifferent concepts. This, by the way, is something also that you'll find in Dostoevsky. Mankind, no matter where you're from, in Pope Donostiev and in Dostoevsky, he is a moral universe. He may, he, he contains spiritual intellectual, as well as physical entities. And so we go back to Plato yet again in these discussions. And, and no matter what I do, I've been lecturing on these topics for 15 years now. And no matter what I do, I end up coming back to Plato. And one of these days, I'm going to do something on him for, for this show. Because Plato is just too extraordinary. Uh, and yet, it comes back to this. This is what the soul is. It has a material element. It has a intellectual element, and it has a spiritual element. Well, the point is, what we're really talking about, what Pope Donostiev is talking about, is that the spiritual life of man needs to be represented in the government no more and no less than the uh, intellectual or the physical parts of humanity. And he's facing a movement Liberal, anarchist, monarch, uh, 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 Marxist, or or materialist, whatever it is, you know, who hold that that a human being is only a machine, more or less intelligent, and he can't take that because he can't take what the consequences of that particular point of view will be. Now, here uh, and the remainder of our time here, I want to talk about the fraud of representation. This is really the heart. Now, you know, he was a Christian. He was, he was somebody, you know, at root, he knew that spirituality meant everything to the state, to a rational life, to an intelligent society. But the ultimate negate, the ultimate negation of reason, the lie of our time, is that somehow parliaments can claim with any reason whatsoever that they represent the will of the people. Nothing is more absolutely absurd than that. They do not, under any circumstances, represent the will of the people. Partially because governments and states in the modern era, and he's talking about, you know, around the turn of the century, are simply too large for any parliament, I don't care how big it is, to claim to be the voice of the people. That is merely cheap propaganda. It's a way to to uh, to fool the common people into accepting whatever big money wants a parliament to hold. And in fact, when you elect a representative, uh, the electors, uh, the people in the district, are giving that representative autonomy. You don't know what's going on in his office. Uh, you don't know what's going on in committee. You don't know what's going on in, you know, when he's meeting with, with big donors. He has full autonomy. And if, you know, if you're not a wealthy, if you're kind of like an average person in a district, you don't matter to the congressman. You don't matter. I've, I've, you know, I, I was a Capitol Hill reporter on DC, in DC for a while. 
when I was with uh, the Spotlight and um, the American Free Press. And I had a good time doing it, and I appreciate, you know, people like Willis Cardo and Chris Petherick who, who uh, gave me that job. And, you know, there is nothing more horrific than walking into a congressional office. Uh, the arrogant, the, 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 the sneers, the contempt. You can't talk to these people. If you're just kind of an average person, you don't matter. All the representative cares about is those with money and influence. Anybody who has any experience on Capitol Hill knows that. And we're talking about, you know, many years after Puppet Onesiev has written his critique of um, representative government. It's representative of nothing but uh, big money. And, you know, even if, even if you, you can develop some kind of a system that can translate individual preferences into government action, which is, you know, ridiculous. But even if you could do that, there is no way, especially on complicated topics, that you can distill the popular will to its fundamentals, to such an extent that you can pass a law, you know, 500 pages, it's about the average, 1,000 pages, it's about the average um, length of any kind of major bill in America today. Uh, there's no way that you can distill uh, the, the popular will in such a way as to, as to make it into public policy. Never mind the fact that you have a bureaucracy and that you have judges who will then go in and negate whatever pieces of it you uh, uh, that they find distasteful. So no matter how you construe the concept, representative government is impossible. So Pope Onostiev is saying, please stop talking about it like this is somehow identical with some kind of libertarian freedom. This is absurd. Nothing could be more stupid. Especially in a modern world where everything is reduced to money and power and utilitarianism and influence and self-interest. That's the last... I mean, there's no way. If, if modernity is defined that way, even a little bit, then there is no way that you are going to ever be able to, even if you wanted to, reflect the popular will, even if you could determine the popular will on anything other than very simple topics. Public honesty have says that the popular will can be understood in simple form. You know, flag burning and immigrants, that stuff. You know, uh, simple issues, black and white, that, that, you know, that, that could be understood in, uh, uh, in, in popular terms. But in the American experience, none of that has anything to do with public policy. And I know this is, this is relatively common at the end of the 19th century. You see this in Austria, in Germany, even in Great Britain and France. Uh, you, you see the, the, the royalist point of view saying that popular government isn't about the people. It's not about the will of the people. It's not about the will of the church or the spiritual life of the people. It's about those who have the money, who can finance campaigns, and buy airtime and everything else. And I'm not even starting to talk about the media. Because Puppet Onestiev has an entire chapter in his book about a so-called free press. A free press is as much a creation of big money and big business as any politician. That has nothing to do with the people. And now in America... In uh, 2010, uh, it, it, you know, and for a long time before this, it's the major media, a few newspapers, and a few big TV uh, programs and, and, and stations that define what is important, what the issues are, and even more insidious, what the acceptable opinions are. But, you know, neocon and neolib. This is all the except, and occasionally a, a handful of, of libertarians are kind of trendy now. Um, the acceptable opinions on a issue 
uh, is laid out. These opinions, what's acceptable is laid out for the population. So you have things like um, an issue like um, immigration. You know, you have the financial issue of the neocons. You have the, although most neocons are pro-immigration. And then you have the human rights so-called issue of the left on this. And that is about it. And it's exhausting because those of us, and I have the feeling a lot of listeners to this program, refuse to um, accept the slogans of the major media and um, the uh, major press. So it's it's bad enough that any kind of major party in a so-called democratic or republican government is the creation of big money and personal ambition and personal arrogance. You have yet another layer that separates the people from the system uh, in terms of media manipulation. And in many cases, media control is run by the same people who control the major parties. So, Public honesty of, and you know, I, I'm talking about him because he is a, to some extent, a prophet of what modernity and what this kind of nonsense representative government stuff is going to be. <clears throat> it is the mentality of, uh, the business class. It's the mentality of, um, the usurers, those with money, the banks and everything else. You know, Puppet Honesty of kind of has a blind eye to things like the bureaucracy and everything else, and yet, at uh, at, at at the same time, <clears throat> uh, forget about how important it is that if you're going to run for office, you have to put out kind of a very generic program, and then um, and then uh, secure the funding. To make it a reality in in whatever legislative body you're a part of. So this is uh, so so Pope Donosiev is somebody who you know is attacked. I mean, you know, these this point of view uh, should not be attacked by anybody. It should be taken very seriously. The concept of democracy, the way that it developed in the West, is a fraud. It is essentially a means whereby an oligarchy could rule without responsibility. And Pope Donostiev is one of these guys that took so heavily from Dostoevsky. And Dostoevsky holds, if he holds anything at all, he holds to the view that self-will, this kind of willful arrogance, will um, destroy itself. It cannot create absolute values. It cannot create liberty, equality, or fraternity. Because all that matter is, all that matters is the domination of big money, of the needs of the system, and the needs of the oligarchy. Without absolute value, life is a cruel joke. It's an existential fraud. And yet, the system that was being proposed in Dostoevsky's time, as well as in, in uh, Pope Donostiev's time, uh, claims that somehow uh, capitalism and the um, and the rule of uh, uh, the wealthy uh, in representative government can create rep- real, absolute, eternal value. Ultimately, modernity means everything under the state. And when you're under the state, you live the life of an animal. Without immortality, life has no meaning, or at least no enduring meaning. And in all of these concepts, Pobodonostiev and Dostoevsky are absolutely identical. And I want to hold to the view that Dostoevsky and Pobodonostiev, at least on the essential philosophical issues, are exactly the same. So, uh, I want to cut it a little short uh, today. Um, uh, I um, I want to thank everybody. I know that that some people have uh, 
Uh, I have I have had a lot of uh, letters that have been sent to me and emails and everything asking me to do more shows, and I want to thank those people, you know, um, and I want to apologize to anybody who I've offended because I I didn't mean to offend. I could be a very arrogant individual, and I'm I'm sorry for that. I shouldn't be, because I'm a sinner like anybody else, and um, and I shouldn't be be like that. And um, uh, I, I want to apologize to anybody that I've ever offended. And I want to start over again new, as I've said before, and do a few more shows here. Because, frankly, I think that the voice of reason is doing some excellent work. I don't agree with everything, but that's not a big deal. It's the same battle against the New World Order. And the way that we interpret this stuff, it's the Antichrist manifesting his power throughout the world. Only now can there be such a thing as world government. World government, however, was predicted in um, the scriptures, in uh, Ephesians as well as the book of Revelations. We're in an era now where world government is in fact possible. And it's not going to be our friends who run it. But I want to warn my friends as well as some of my opponents that even if our nationalist people were to take over, there's every reason to believe that they would act as arrogantly towards us as the system acts towards us today. So... um uh, to my friends, I want to say thank you for writing me. I appreciate the confidence you've put in me. And to my opponents, I want to say thank you for keeping me on my toes because that's what we all need in this struggle and in this movement. Uh, next time around, uh, well, I don't know about the next time, but we have I have stuff on, on Google. I've been doing a lot of research recently. And there's a lot that can be done and a lot of stuff in my field that still should be talked about. And, uh, I want to, um, I want to thank you for, for, um, for uh, your comments, both positive and negative. And you know what? If you have a problem, just write me. Write me a note, my email address. I think that they closed my, um, comments, which is okay, I guess. But, um, but it doesn't matter. Just, Write me, and normally I return email within a couple of days. So do that, and um, uh, one way or another, and and I appreciate it, and I thank you very much. God bless. Thanks for listening. The Orthodox Nationalist returns Thursday evening, 9 to 10 p.m. Eastern U.S. Time. Join us at ReasonRadioNetwork.com.